So good afternoon from Beirut and good morning to our friends dialing in in the United States. And hello to our speakers today, whom I have the pleasure of hosting. We hope to achieve in this very ambitious time frame. So our session today is the United States and the Middle East, and it's about investing in dialogue, data, and diplomacy. And we recognize that we are in very special times with a new United States administration coming into fruition and a Middle East going through tremendous conflict, tremendous challenges, and an entire global economic and diplomatic apparatus that has been hit hard by COVID with a global recovery taking a lot more time than expected. So we are against the backdrop of a number of unique and unprecedented conditions and mm -hmm. situations and our panel today is actually the only panel on the Middle East. And so I feel the heavy responsibility of making sure, Falah and Nadine, that we do a great job today. But no pressure. <laughs> so I'd love to begin by, by setting the stage and inviting us to really appreciate that when it comes to the Middle East, we recognize to not treat it as one singular entity. We recognize that it is a region of diverse groups, communities, ethnicities, nationalities, that whilst we have an Arabic language that brings many of us together, Arabic is not the only spoken language in our region, nor is it spoken in a common universal dialect. We also recognize that the Middle East is a place where we often, as a region, don't always um, find it easy to express our diversity and our authenticity to the rest of the world, making it so important when a new American administration comes along to do our part to effectively serve and represent our region in the best ways that we can. But we also recognize that we are here with an opportunity of hopefully coming as close as possible to a clean slate, one where it is our hope that a new administration will come not only with new ears and new eyes, but also new tools and ways of listening and new priorities that are not just driven by what the world demands from the Middle East, but Is not here. Hmm. Dean is the <laughs> Internet tape, 
Det er der jo et test. Ja, det kan jeg. When we seem to have lost your, your audio. So give me just we heard you a little bit. Let me switch my back one second. Okay. I got you then. You came back for a minute. <clears throat> we lost audio and video this time. <laughs> you will be right back, I am sure. Thanks everyone for hanging with us while we figure out the technology. Good. Hmm. What it feels like to be dialing in from Lebanon, I'd like to apologize. going in and out a little bit. <coughs> to ask Nadine, I was Stage for us. So um, we lost you in the end. So maybe I don't know if you call in me, maybe call me and I can put your audio on because we can see you. We just can't hear you. So maybe we do the audio that way. But I know we were going to talk a little bit about So I'll go ahead and jump in um, a little bit about um, President Biden um, and his um, priority and where the Middle East stand as a priority today for the Biden administration. It, you know, there's a lot of talk about moving away from focusing on the Middle East. But when you look at President Biden's actions, since for the last two months, um, you know, we stopped the U.S. support for the war in Yemen, ordered airstrikes against Iranian-backed fighters in Syria, refused to hold MBS accountable in the Khashoggi, here, you know, um, killing. So spoken to that issue, ordered the defense secretary to take a look at where all the troops are being um, stationed um, to assess where the U.S. might need to pull back or might need to put more resources abroad. Um, renewed the New START nuclear, a non-proliferation treaty with Russia. And of course, Russia is a big player in the Middle East. So when you look at all of the things that the president is focused on, so many of them touch the Middle East that, that when people say, oh, the, the president's moving away from the Middle East, I don't see how, how people are thinking, how, how they're seeing proof of that. I think if anything, he's taken a look again at the Middle East in, in terms, you know, he promised like everyone to do forever wars, but yet, you know, also not to, to leave our allies. Um, um, so I really think that if you look at the president's, um, you know, speeches recently, his um, February 4th foreign policy speech, he said, you know, uh, we must start with diplomacy rooted in America's most cherished democratic values, defending freedom, championing opportunity, upholding universal rights, respecting the rule of law and treating every person with dignity. That's the grounding water of our global policy, our global power. That's our inexhaustible source of strength. That's America's abiding advantage. So, you know, when you, when you take a look at this idea of, um, you know, really cherished democratic values, you know, so many of our allies and so many of the countries in the Middle East don't share our democratic values. So it's really, interesting, you know, with, with him making this a priority, 
you know, it, it gives us a good opportunity to, to relook at our, how the Middle East is set up and, and where are those democratic values that, that, that President Biden can support. Well, uh, thank you. I did not hear your voice, but I think the question is to me now. But uh, certainly today is a different world. With the new administration in Washington, the Middle East also needs a new look and a new start to see how can handle this situation. First, the U.S. leadership is necessary. And I think there is a kind of unanimity that there needs to be a U.S. leadership at the global stage. But with leadership comes responsibility as well. So therefore, it is important that we build some alliances, mm -hmm. alliances around the shared values, the democratic values that we believe in, Europe believes in, the United States, and all friendly nations who stand for values. So this is an opportunity that we can do something to, to create alliances, have a common ground, and reach out to people who need support and assistance. And the point is that the Middle East is, re the Middle East is rich, is diverse. It has uh, centuries of history, culture, tradition, ethnicities, religious groups. With that richness, of course, you have to expect problems. But for the U.S., it needs to have a hands-on policy, a policy of engagement and not a hands-off policy and disengagement. Because no matter what, you both rightly mentioned all the issues that have been even demonstrated by the current administration vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East. But the Middle East is not only problems. The Middle East is also opportunities. So that's why if we can handle this, we, we need to have public diplomacy. We need to have our message heard by those who share the same values and same principles, building alliances, addressing the needs, whether we work on education, on culture, on sports, getting people closer to each other. Now we have kind of bits and pieces of policy here and there. But if we can have a proper Middle East policy, but within Middle East also to have specific policy for Iraq, for Iran, for Israel, for Turkey, for uh, the Gulf, each of these, but they should integrate, not one to stand alone, because it's a kind of a global, a global situation when it also needed a global approach, because you can't have only, you can't be selective in the Middle East to choose only two problems, let's say Iran and Israel, and leave the rest. No, that doesn't work. The U.S. leadership is needed, is necessary, but alliances are important. We have NATO, we have EU, and also these regional powers, which are for us superpowers. How can we deal with them? What is their limit? What's their role? What's their responsibility? What kind of arrangement is there? Are we working for a new security architecture in the Middle East, or we go by the old ones? Or we will give room to the current regional powers to play that dominant role? These are all questions. But realizing that the new administration has a lot of issues on its plate, domestic issues as well as global issues, issues of urgency and importance, importance and also issues that can wait. But prioritizing the issues, I believe Middle East should come at the center. It should not be forgotten. It should not be ignored, but it has to come at the heart because there are lots of people who would be affected by U.S. policy in the Middle East one way or another. We're still not getting your verbal, unfortunately. So if you want to call, like I said, I can put my phone up and this way we could hear you. So um, I'd recommend that. But I know that the, the next um, question that, that that you had sent was about um, why is approaching opportunities for engagement, diplomacy, and partnership from a religious freedom lens a relevant perspective for the U.S. 
going forward in this region. So I serve as a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. And so we, we, we do have a, 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 a single focus, um, laser focus on religious freedom. Obviously, in this context, I do look a little bit broader in some of my other work. But first of all, I think that countries that um, support religious freedom are more stable, more prosperous. They're better partners. Um, religious freedom is also a quick test to see who shares our values. You know, certainly the KRG, the Kurdish Regional Government, shares our values. You know, the autonomous administration in North East Syria serves, shares our values. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of countries in the Middle East, uh, frankly, don't. And so, you know, the, 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 the State Department is all about diplomacy with nation states. But we need to look wider and broader in order to find real solutions in the Middle East. Obviously, you know, countries will always be the priority in foreign policy. I'm not suggesting they're not, but perhaps we need to stop looking at them for all the answers, for all the solutions. So, so stability comes from good governance that has legitimacy with its people. You know, we, we used to love the word self-determination, but it seems to have fallen out of favor. I don't even hear that word used anymore in a foreign policy um, um, setting very often. Actually, I I haven't heard it in a very long time. So the question is, is it even a priority? You know, in the interim national security strategic guidance, President Biden, and he says in the opening that democracy, as I mentioned before, holds the key to freedom, prosperity, peace, and dignity. And he stresses the importance of working with democratic partners, but we're not seeing that in the, in the Middle East. Um, we haven't for the, the last several years. So, you know, thousands of people at the State Department and the Defense Department, they could not force the kind of conditions we see on the ground in Northeast Syria and Northern Iraq and even in southern Yemen, these places have an inclination towards freedom, towards democracy. In these areas, the people have chosen to build local governance that supports their values. Even if all those governments don't have legitimacy on the, the world stage, we can still easily support them. So it's, it's ridiculous, for instance, that um, for Syria, you know, UN Resolution 2254 puts the the future of Syria in the hands of countries like China, Iran, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. And yet the only successful government on the ground in, in Syria, the autonomous administration in North East Syria, is not even in, included in, in a discussion about a, a political solution. You know, the process with the Turkish-backed Syrian opposition coalition is simply not sustainable for long-term peace because it's not including um, the, the local players that are the ones fighting for democracy. So to me, it's like live action role play. It looks and feels real, but it can't produce real results. So, you know, as, as the president stressed, I think we need to look at our democratic partners, look at those who share our values, as Fala said, and partner with them, strengthen them. And, and I think that will be a way that we can broaden how yeah. U.S. policy um, looks to, to solve the problems in the Middle East. Well, I'm not hearing you, Lynn, again, but uh, I believe I echo what uh, Nadine has said. But it was very encouraging for us to hear from President Biden to say U.S. is back and diplomacy is back. These were very strong messages and reassuring messages for the people around the world, but also for the Middle East who were waiting to see what approach will be there in the new administration. This is one. Second, there has to be a kind of very honest, transparent, and strategic partnerships on good governance and ending the hypocrisy, which is a major issue here in this part of the world. People tell you something, they do something else. People pretend to be standing for something, but they are not. That's why let's end this kind of hypocrisy and have clear-cut partnerships based on human rights, freedom of press, freedom of religion, the practice of religion. We are proud in Kurdistan region of Iraq to, to believe in diversity, and we see this diversity as richness and as strength and not weakness, but we need to be supported. Supporting countries who believe in democracy and share values by strengthening their institutions, by strengthening the civil society, by enabling them to be able to protect themselves and the, the groups that they represent. Otherwise, people will fear the risk of the future, the unknown and the uncertainties of the future. And there are means and ways. The U.S. has lots of tools in its hands, whether we talk about its 
normal diplomacy or public diplomacy, the energy diplomacy, the cultural diplomacy, commercial diplomacy. There are there are means and ways for the U.S. to impose on these countries. And also, when the U.S. is trying to help other countries to have it to be conditioned, to be linked, the linkage is very important to ensure that these countries abide by these diplomatic these democratic values. And I'm also really pleased with the 3D, three <laughs> dimension of this panel, investing in uh, uh, diplomacy, the, the data, and uh, democracy. So the 3D is important. It's a new approach. Uh, data to be shared, democracy to be strengthened and consolidated, and diplomacy to be the means. Yes, we do not want to see any new wars in the Middle East. We have seen more than necessary wars and disruptions in this part of the world. It's time for peace, for pr prosperity, and for people to feel safe about their future. It, it is important, since the U.S. wants a peaceful and stable Middle East, since they want to avoid any new wars, then let's be engaged more deeply engaged to see what are the problems, what ways we can handle, whether it's through track two diplomacy or through the, the well felt and public diplomacy, because we need to uh, dot the I's and cross the T's in order to make sure that these are the problems. Hiding problems will not solve them, ignoring the problems will not solve them, and problems will not be solved if they are left to time because time will further complicate it. We have learned that lesson here in Kurdistan and Iraq, because there were issues we wanted them to be to have solved. In 2003, with the fall of the regime, they said, no, wait, we will have a constitution. We want to have legal and constitutional solutions. 16 years have passed after the constitution was adopted by the majority of the Iraqi people. We are still there at square zero, asking for the same problems to be resolved. So when you come and you help build democracies, stay from A to Z until you deliver, because this is an unfinished business. Iraq is not a fully a democratic state. Yes, we have seen a number of elections, but elections do not <laughs> uh, prove that this country is the democratic. We have real and serious problems. Therefore, it is good for the U.S. to stay engaged, to have a hands-on policy, to encourage Erbil and Baghdad through the U.N., through other international uh, flora, to, to engage in dialogue, no matter how long these dialogues will last. But it's important to address these issues and not to allow the use of force to sort out problems. And also we have a constitution, which is the law of the land. People have voted for it in order to go one by one to address them. This is, I'm talking about Armenia and Baghdad and Iraq, but I'm sure in other countries, each has got its own set of problems. For the U.S. to define its role and responsibility, but also the nature of its relationship with X country, to say, look, we have these observations. You have to improve your record on ABC. And this has, it has to be a transactional and also to be uh, uh, deliver, deliverables have to be measured. If country A delivers the promises and uh, keeps its promises on the pledges and this, then there has to be more support and more uh, assistance to that country. Right. And I, I think that you, you made a really important point, and, with, with, and this is a perfect example of a, a role we can play. You know, the, the U.S. pushed for, for a new constitution in Iraq, and it was ratified in 2005. And one of the key portions of the constitution was that the disputed territories would be decided by 2007. So here we are, <laughs> 2021, and the disputed territories have still not been settled. And so, you know, because of that, you've seen ISIS rise up, you've seen uh, uh, Iranian militia shows this, this um, void, the security void that exists because of, 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 of the constitution not being followed has, has put all the religious, that's rich area of the Nineveh Plains um, with the, the most religiously diverse population in the Middle East, maybe in the world, when, when you have Christians, you have Yazidis, you have Jabak, you have Kakai, and of course, Sunni and Shia, and, um, you know, all in this, this area um, without a real structure um, for security. 
um, is, is a, so that's another way the U.S. could step in and, and demand that, that and help to bring together um, the KRG and the, the Iraqi government and, and, and d- demand that, that it gets settled. And there is a constitutional process to do that. Um, Lynn, are we able to hear you yet? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> but she did um, invite us to answer question number four, which is if the Biden administration does take a step back on its foreign policy in the Middle East, is there an opportunity for Middle Eastern governments to step up? Where are the opportunities for building new foundations for trust, deep listening, and new levels of understanding? You know, I believe the U.S. government can can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can still deal with China and in the Middle East. You know, I think that it's important that the U.S. not step back um, in the sense that, you know, we talked about the kind of countries, the Middle Eastern countries, so many of them don't share our values. So if we're going to step back, does that mean Iran has a bigger piece of the pie? Does that mean Turkey steps in? We're in a situation that it, long term w- will mean we have to come back in a bigger way. So I think it's really important that we hold the ground. We have those places that do have um, um, democracies that do support our values. We need to keep them strong. You know, I, I think the part of the problem is we look, we can't solve, and, and I think the president said this so many times, we can't solve you know, the foreign policy problems from, from, you know, yesterday or today with yesterday's answers. And so I think what, when you're looking at Iraq and when you're looking at Syria in particular, you know, I think we keep trying to look for those big answers to solve the big problems. When I think what we need to do is look back and say, okay, so Iraq, for instance, is a mess. The prime minister and the members of parliament are pretty much hostages to Iran, regardless of how they feel personally. So rather than waiting for Iran to be weakened, to keep doing sanctions, I'm, I'm, we continue to do the things. We have to look at where where their strength in, in the KRG, obviously, is a key ally of ours. They're not getting their fair share of the budget from the Iraqi government. And, you know, we can change that. We can give money and say, if we're not going to continue to pay the Iraqi government, if you're not going to give the portion that's due to the KRG, they have all these over 700,000 IDPs, you know, they're funding, they're not getting the full funding for, you know, and they have been a refuge that for religious minorities and, and we should respect them and stand with them for that. You look at the Nineveh Plains and Sinjar, they should have a right to self-governance. You know, these are things we can help push while we're still looking at the big Iraq. And the same thing in Syria. You know, Assad, everyone keeps thinking he's this close to being gone and here he still is. So if we just wait for an Assad answer, um, <laughs> we're, 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 we're losing time. So what we need to be doing is supporting the autonomous administration, supporting those that share our value while we're still looking for a larger political solution. You know, the U S commission is, is an international religious freedom has made some recommendations that we lift sanctions on the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, that, that area, that would be, you know, if you want to hit Assad hard, that would do it. You know, give political recognition as a local government, not as an independent government. They're, they're not separatists. They're not nationalists. You know, any, these these talking points from Turkey about the PKK, you know, send send U.S. government officials in to audit the government. You know, no one's suggesting unconditional support. What you know, go in and take a look and and say we want these changes. The key is we've got to figure out where there are these democratic values, where we can support them, even if the bigger picture is still a problem. There's ways that we can strengthen our partners, and it makes a lot of sense for us to do that. Uh, I agree that. It is important for the U.S. to stay engaged and to be proactive. The price for inaction is much higher than the price for action and engagement. That's why this is important. Second, I echo what Nadine has said. There are success stories in U.S. engagement in the Middle East. Then strengthen, consolidate these success stories so that people see when they are cooperating and partnering with the U.S., they will be better off in terms of human rights, prosperity, uh, engagement with the outside world, etc., etc. Therefore, the situation is not either or policy for the U.S. to be engaged with Middle East or to leave it for China and Southeast Asia, etc. You can handle both. The U.S. is big. It's yeah. huge. They have huge machine to, to work. Therefore, it should not be an either or. But at the same time, to have a clear policy, for example, for Iran to have a policy, for Iraq to have a policy, for Turkey, but not deal with Iraq in the shadow of Iran policy. Right. right. Have an Iraq policy. And within Iraq, we in Kurdistan region of Iraq, we would very much like to have a section that would be uh, allocated for Kurdistan region to to help us and also promote the issues which are important to both of us. Safety and security, stability, prosperity, 
uh, U.S. investment in Kurdistan region, good relations with the uh, neighboring countries and beyond. So these are all issues that can be handled when we work closer. Unfortunately, in the past, uh, the, all countries, they had one Iraq policy, including the U.S., but that was not clearly defined. When Iraqis themselves were not unified and they were fighting each other, from outside, and namely the U.S. had a one Iraq policy. Okay, you have a one Iraq policy, but then you have to have a situation when the Iraqis are united and have one vision for a future, for a future that they share. So help us build that shared vision so that you can tell us that we have a one Iraq policy. Being realistic, being pragmatic, and also deal with the issues as they are. And engage with the local people who know the problems, the nature of the problems, much better than outsiders who do not understand all dimensions of these problems. But I believe time has come for the U.S. to open a new page to deal with Middle Eastern countries one by one, each with its own set of problems and opportunities, because I believe there are too many opportunities in the Middle East. The people, the public, very much to ha desire to have strong ties with the United States and with the West. But we have not established the pathway and the route for that. Great. Great. Um, I, I know that we put, put out that we can now go to our closing remarks. So I believe that, Fala, we're going to start with you, uh, since I know you have uh, another engagement. Thank you. <laughs> well, is a new American administration a new space for fresh alliances? Absolutely, I agree with this question. If I read the question, it says, is a new American administration a new space for fresh alliances with governments and communities in the region? What common visions and objectives will likely drive those new partnerships? Absolutely, we need new alliances, new partnerships built upon very clear principles. The U.S. has made it clear. It stands for human rights, for rule of law, for democracy, for good governance, for etc., etc. So this is important. Based on these solid principles, build alliances. It can be a test period to see whether they deliver or not. I believe this would be the right approach for the United States. We have had a difficult past and history. Let's not live in the past. Let's be forward-looking and be focused on the future, but also with, uh, with a kind of an orientation towards results so that people see results. If we look at uh, X country dealing with the United States and we see progress, we see prosperity, we see stability, that would encourage other countries also to follow suit. I believe now is the right time for the U.S. to engage with Middle Eastern countries. I know there is fatigue in the U.S., maybe a fatigue in the wars. The U.S. does not want to enter wars anymore. We are tired of wars in this part of the world. We have suffered as a result of these wars. Time has come for peace and stability, but alone we cannot do it. Alone it cannot be done because there are too many interferences in internal affairs of these countries. Countries are not sovereign. For example, in Iraq, we need Iraq to be free, democratic, independent, and sovereign, which is not. So therefore, through the UN, through NATO, through the EU, and other alliances, we can, have, we can open a new page, a new start for building a strong alliance that, ba that is based on shared democratic values, and that would deliver what people have been hoping for. And thank you very much indeed. That, that's, that's, that's perfect. Thank you, Bill. And I'll just add on that. You know, um, first, you know, when we're talking about, you know, what common visions and objectives will drive these new alliances, you know, and, and um, you know, first, not all leaders are in government. In Afghanistan, for instance, many of the leaders, legitimate leaders are not in government and they have the ability to solve problems and secure ground. Uh, tribal leaders, um, you know, when you look around the Middle East, there's a lot of players that aren't necessarily in government and the U.S. needs to be engaging with them. Second of all, it's hard to talk about new alliances without mentioning the Abraham Accords. You know, we need to be think, think, think differently about these alliances. Obviously, these were really important, you know, um, with, with, with Israel and the UAE and Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, Kosovo, and apparently there's others that are, are being looked at, and I understand normalization is in sight for Saudi Arabia and Israel. You know, these are huge moments, you know, and it just shows us that we need to think outside the box in terms of how Nadine, if you allow me one point, I would yes. like to mention a very important point. 
People who have power are outside of the government and parliament. This is a core problem here in Iraq, including Kurdistan region. You've got too many powerful people outside the government, the state is tra- structure and in the government, but they are more powerful than the government, the government and the parliament itself. So that is one way of addressing for the U.S. to help. How can we address situations when we have such kind of situations? And thank you very much for inviting me. I have to run to this commitment as I asked you earlier. Thank you, and I wish you all the best. Thank you, Paula. No, I think that was a really important point. That it's important if we're going to strengthen, you know, work with those outside of government. We're not putting them in a position where where they're weakening the legitimate government. Because um, I think stability is the key. And I think another thing, you know, that that we haven't really touched on yet is, you know, ISIS and extremism. That's still a problem in the Middle East. And, you know, the, but yet, you know, the only way to permanently destroy their chance of rebuilding is governance, um, where people have a say in their own governance, their own security, where they can create jobs, families, communities. And, you know, it's the disenfranchised that, that join in extremism and, and having, you know, people have a say in their own governance, their own futures, where they can get involved um, and, 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 and not be disenfranchised. So that building that local governance from the bottom on up is is the only way that we're going to be able to have these communities not be available for extremists to come in and organize. So I think, you know, that that is another a byproduct of, of building governance and supporting good governance, that, which is something I think the U.S. has got to look a little bit more at going forward in the Middle East. And thank you, Lynn, for having us. Um, I believe then we're closing. And I want to thank all the guests. And unfortunately, technology is not always friendly. And, you know, coming from Lebanon, I know that um, why the, <laughs> the Internet access and, you know, this is a global meeting. So we're going to run into global problems. Thank you, Lynn, for organizing it for the questions and Fala for joining. And thank you all the guests for coming today as well. I hope this was an interesting conversation. Thank you.